So welcome to London Learning Lean. Uh, next week, we've got Yale Dillies from the University of Cambridge, who's going to tell us about Behrens construction and uh, additive combinatorics. But this week, I'm very pleased to welcome Maria Ines uh, from our own parish, who's going to tell us about her work on extensions of norms and Fontaine period rings. Hey, thanks. Um, so I'm going to tell you about a project that I have been working on for the past few months. Uh, so this is the plan for today's talk. First, I'm going to give you some motivation as to why I'm working on this. And my first motivation was to construct uh, the periodic version of the complex numbers. Uh, in order to do this, we are going to need to talk about norms on rings or fields and also uh, how they behave when we consider extensions of fields. Uh, so that will be maybe like the largest part of the talk and it should be accessible for a large audience. And then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to focus on some number theory applications. Uh, and I'm going to use the fact that we have now formalized the definition of uh, CP and combine that with some of the other things that we have in MATLAB uh, to define uh, the period rings uh, before state and beta run. Uh, I should say that all of this is work in progress. So some of the things that I will discuss today uh, may be different from uh, how they will be done in the final version of the formalization. And also I'll conclude the talk by um, by telling you what I'm still, what I still have to do in this project and what I plan to do next. Okay. So let's start by reviewing how we think, how we construct the complex numbers, right? So we have um, the rational numbers and we have the usual Euclidean norm on the rational numbers. If we take the completion with respect to this norm, uh, we get the uh, field of real numbers, right? Now this field is complete by definition, but it's not algebraically closed. So what we do is we take the algebraic closure and that is uh, the field of complex numbers. Uh, it turns out that uh, this uh, Euclidean norm extends uh, to C and moreover C is complete with respect to this norm. So we now have some a field extension C of Q, which is both uh, complete with respect to this norm and uh, algebraically closed. Uh, however, uh, the Euclidean norm is not the only norm that we can consider on, on the rational numbers. In fact, for every prime number P, we get uh, the periodic norm. And we can ask if we can construct some kind of analog of the complex numbers for the periodic norm. So first, let's, let me quickly remind you uh, how this uh, periodic norm is defined. So we are going to fix some prime number P for today. And then uh, the periodic valuation of an integer number R is just going to be the number of times that P appears in the factorization of R. Now we can extend this to the rational numbers just by saying that uh, the valuation of a fraction is valuation of the numerator minus valuation of the denominator. And uh, we can uh, construct a corresponding uh, absolute value or a corresponding norm, which is going to be defined as uh, the norm of P, or sorry, the norm of X uh, is going to be P to the power of the negative of the periodic valuation of X. And it's easy to check that this has the properties of being an absolute value, and moreover, it is a non archimedean absolute value. Okay, so let's try to do the same thing as we did to construct C, right? So first, uh, well, QP is the completion of Q with respect to the periodic norm, uh, in the same way that R was the completion of Q with respect to the Euclidean norm. Um, and the next thing that we did was we took the algebraic closure. So now we take the algebraic closure of QP and we ask if this is the analog of the complex numbers. Uh, however, we are going to start some things are different in this case. Uh, the first thing that is different is that uh, the extension uh, C over R is of degree two, right? But in this case, we get uh, an extension of infinite degree, actually. Um, even though this extension has infinite degree, we will see uh, in the next part of the talk that we can still extend uh, the periodic norm to this algebraic closure. 
And moreover, that this extension is going to be unique. It's the only norm on the algebraic cross that extends the periodic norm. Uh, however, uh, the, the, this algebraic cross is not going to be complete with respect to the periodic norm. So to get an analog of the complex numbers, we have to do an extra step. We have to complete uh, with respect to this norm. Um, can I note this maybe? Oh, okay. um, yeah, so we define CP to be the completion of the algebraic closure with respect to the norm. And now we can check that this is, well, this is complete by definition, but this is also algebraically closed. So this is the analog of the complex numbers that we were looking for. Okay, so the hard part here is showing that um, this periodic norm can be extended to the algebraic closure. So that's what we are going to do now. And to do that, first I have to start by introducing some definitions. Um, so let R be a commutative ring. Um, first, a semi-norm on the ring R is going to be a function from R to the non-negative real numbers, such that uh, the semi-norm of zero is equal to zero, uh, such that it, it satisfies the triangle inequality. So the semi-norm of R plus S is less than or equal to the sum of the semi-norms. And it's also sub-multiplicative. So the semi-norm of the product is less than or equal to the product of the semi-norms. Um, we'll say that the semi-norm is power multiplicative if uh, for every element in the ring and any positive real number, uh, sorry, a positive uh, natural number we have, uh, the norm of R to the n is the same as the norm of R uh, raised to the nth power. We'll take that a semi-norm is a sub-multiplicative norm if um, the norm is equal to zero only for the element R is equal to zero. And we'll say that a submultiplicative norm is a norm if we have equality for multiplication, right? So if the norm of R times X is equal to the product of the norms. Okay, and today we are always going to consider two extra uh, axioms. So we are only going to consider non-Archimedean semi-norms, which means that I am going to replace the triangle inequality by something stronger, which is the condition that uh, the norm of R minus S has to be less than or equal to, uh, well, semi-norm of R, uh, to the maximum semi-norm of R, semi-norm of S. And I am also going to assume that the norm of one is bounded by one. And if you think about it, this means that either the norm of one is equal to one or the norm of one is equal to zero, in which case your norm is just a zero function. So maybe not so interesting. Okay. Um, Last definition that we need is if now we have uh, an R algebra norm A, uh, sorry, an R algebra A, we are going to define an R algebra norm. So this is going to be some kind of norm on A, which is compatible with the algebra structure. So precisely uh, is a submultiplicative norm on A, such that if I take uh, the norm of R acting on A, uh, that should be the norm of R times the norm of A. Okay, um, so the periodic norm is an example of this, right? So the periodic norm is a non-archimedian norm on QP, and we have that the norm of one is equal to one. We want to show that it extends uniquely to the algebra closure. So a more general question that we can ask is if we have a field K with a non-archimedian norm, maybe submultiplicative, and we have some field extension L over K, is it always possible to extend this norm to L? And if it is possible, uh, do we have uniqueness for this extension? So the answer is going to be yes, but with some conditions, right? And the way that I'm going to prove this is uh, following the book uh, Non-Archimedian Analysis by both uh, Gunther Remer. So every time you see PGR in the talk, that's what I'm referring to. And I, I should point out that if you are familiar with this book, uh, the terminology that I'm using here is not exactly the same as the terminology they use, uh, but that is because I'm trying to make uh, the terminology more, more compatible with what we have in MATLAB. Okay, so hopefully that won't be too confusing. 
Okay. So uh, I said that the answer is yes, if we have some conditions on the fields. The first condition that we need is that the extension L over K has to be algebraic. Um, and if the extension is algebraic, I'm actually going to tell you what uh, one extension of the norm in K is to, the, to, to a norm in L. So the way we, this, this is called the spectral norm. And the, the way we define it is first, for every polynomial with coefficients in K, uh, every monic polynomial, sorry, we are going to define the spectral value of the polynomial to be the maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients raised to this power one over N minus uh, the index of, of the coefficients. And then uh, the spectral norm, is going to be the function from L to the non-negative fields, even by taking uh, uh, the spectral value of the minimal polynomial of Y over K. So because I am assuming that this is an algebraic extension, I, I always have uh, a well-defined minimal polynomial. Okay. So yeah, this is how you do this in, in MAFIF. Uh, first, the spectral norm um, well, in, in lean, sorry, this is not in material. The spectral norm is something that you can uh, define for any ring R, not necessarily for a field. Um, so, well, here I've defined the spectral value of a polynomial in Rx. Um, I, yeah, I just applied the formula to get each of the coefficients that I saw you in the previous slide, and then I take the supremum of all of these coefficients. And once I have the spectral value, if I consider an algebraic extension of fields, I can define the spectral norm of an element in the field L as the spectral value of the minimal polynomial uh, of the element of IP. Okay. okay. And now I want to prove um, what I'm calling extension theorems. So the first one is that I can always extend uh, the norm if I have an algebraic extension of fields, right? So the hypothesis here are that I have a field with a power multiplicative norm. Uh, I have an, extend, an algebraic extension L over K, and then G L over K is going to denote the group of K algebra automorphisms of L. Uh, the first claim here is that the spectral norm, as I told you before, is a power multiplicative K algebra norm on L, that extends the given norm on K. And we can actually say a bit more. We can say that all uh, K algebra isomorphisms of L are going to be isometries for the spectral norm, and that any other power multiplicative K algebra norm on L is going to be bounded above by the spectral norm. Um, if the extension L over K is moreover finite than normal, uh, then we have some kind of unique, uniqueness claim. We have that the spectral norm is going to be the only power multiplicative K algebra norm for which all of these um, elements of G L over K are isometries. And moreover, we get this formula uh, for the spectral norm in terms of uh, in terms of the isometries of L over K. Right? So the spectral norm of an element is going to be the maximum of the norms of G of X, where G varies over the elements of G L over K. And you can compute this with respect to any um, power multiplicative norm on L that extends the norm on K. Okay. Now, if we add some extra conditions on the norm, we will actually get a uniqueness result. So what we have to, what we have to assume is that first, uh, the norm is uh, multiplicative, not just power multiplicative, and also that uh, the field K is complete with respect to this norm. So if we have that, then uh, for any algebraic extension L over K, the spectral norm on L is going to be the unique uh, norm on L, and here I mean multiplicative norm, that extends the norm on K. Okay, so going back to our motivating example, QP is complete with respect to the periodic norm, which is a non-Archimedean norm. 
Uh, so we can extend uh, the periodic norm uniquely to the algebraic uh, closer, and then we define CP by taking the completion. So let me show you the, the formalization of CP. Um, well, we fix a prime number P. We define the algebraic closure of QP. And then, um, well, we already had in math with the fact that, of course, uh, this extension is algebraic. And I'm going to define a non field, oops, sorry, um, a non field extractor on, on the algebraic closure of QP by saying that the non field extractor comes uh, from the spectral norm on the algebraic closure. Okay. Uh, right. So then, uh, once I have the, the norm field structure on QP algebraic, I can define CP as the completion of QP algebraic with respect to this periodic norm. Okay. So wait, I think there are questions in the chat or. No. Oh, that was just. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so okay, so now I'm going to tell you a bit about how to prove these extension theorems. So first, we are going to prove existence. Right? Uh, to do this, we start with a lemma. We start by uh, saying that uh, if I have a field with a power multiplicative norm and I have a finite extension L over K, um, then there's always going to be um, at least one power multiplicative K algebra norm on L that extends the norm on K. But so how does this work? So, well, first we are going to fix a basis of L over K and I'm going, I'm going to assume that the first element of, of the basis is equal to one. This is so that we get that the norm actually extends the norm in K. And now, if I want to define the norm of, a element or of an element in L, what I'm going to do is I am going to express it in terms of these spaces, and I'm going to define a function that is going to be the maximum of the norms of the coefficients. Now, uh, is this the thing that we are looking for? Well, not quite, right? So it has some of the right properties. It has the, the property that uh, the value at zero is equal to zero. And also, um, if you take these, a pseudo norm of x minus y, this is going to be less than or equal to the maximum. Um, but it's not sub multiplicative, right? Uh, it's almost sub multiplicative in the sense that we can prove that there is some uh, positive real number m such that if you take the, this, well, I'm going to call this norm, even though it's not a norm. If you take the norm of x, y, this is less than or equal to m times norm of x times norm of y for every uh, pair of elements x, y, and l. Okay, so now uh, what we have to do is we have to do what uh, VGR call smoothing procedures. So I'm not going to get much into the details here, but uh, in general, what this means is that you start with a function, which is some kind of seminar or something that is close to being a seminar. And then uh, starting from that function, you define another function that is related to it, and that is going to be a seminar with better properties. So in this case, um, we start with this function that is not really a seminar because we don't have the submultiplicative condition, but we have this other boundedness condition here. Uh, so we apply this first proposition in VGR, and that proposition tells us that under these conditions, we can construct uh, a seminar, right? So we can get uh, something that is going to be sub multiplicative. So we can get rid of this M here. And this seminar is still going to be a K algebra norm on L and it's still going to extend uh, the norm on K. Okay, uh, it's still not power multiplicative, which is what we have in the statement here. So for that, we have to do another of these smoothing procedures. Right, so the second is machine procedure, you feed it one, uh, one seminar, and it's going to give you back a power multiplicative seminar. So once you do that, um, 
that, that, that one is going to be the function that we were looking for. It's going to be a power multiplicative k algebra normal L that extends the normal k. And this is uh, actually the only point in the proof where we crucially need the hypothesis that the norm is non archimedean right? So for the previous um, smoothing procedure, we, we can still do that for uh, Archimedean norms. But for this one, for this second uh, smoothing procedure, we really need the fact that the norm is Archimedean. Oh, sorry, it's non archimedean OK. So we have shown that we can always extend um, a power multiplicative norm on K to a power multiplicative norm on a finite, finite extension of K. Uh, let's, use, let's use this to prove the first uh, extension here. Right? So in, the, in this extension theorem, we have the hypothesis that L over K is algebraic. Right? So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to reduce to the case where L over K is finite and normal. Right? This was the second uh, the second part that we had in the statement of the theorem. And we can do this because uh, to check each of the properties of being a norm, we can actually work in small extensions. Right? So for example, if I, if I want to check that the norm of uh, x times y is less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y, I don't have to work in L. I can just work in the normal closure of the extension k adjoint x, y. Right. And that uh, normal closure is going to be a finite and normal extension. So I have reduced to this case. Okay. Now, in this case, we can apply the lemma that we just saw to say that uh, there's going to be some power multiplicative k algebra norm on L that extends uh, the norm on k. Um, now we do another smoothing step. So in, in this case, the smoothing step is going to be um, taking some maximum over the elements of this GL over K. So I start by using this power, power multiplicative norm that I just constructed. Uh, I take the norm of G of Y, where this uh, planning over all of the uh, K algebra automorphisms of L, and then I define uh, y sub g to be uh, the maximum. Okay. Um, okay. So it's easy to see that if you take the maximum of a finite collection of of, of seminomes, you are still going to get a seminom. Okay. So this is still going to be a power multiplicative k algebra norm on L, and it's still going to extend the norm on k. And also, clearly by definition, uh, all of the um, K algebra automorphisms of L are going to be isometries with respect to this norm. Right. So if you recall the statement here, uh, we were claiming that um, the spectral norm was the only power multiplicative K algebra norm for which all of these automorphisms were isometries. So now to finish the proof, we have to check that um, this um, norm Y sub G that we have just defined. Um, is actually equal to the spectral norm. Okay, and to do this, uh, you just have to think about what the uh, minimal polynomial of Y looks like. Um, the minimal polynomial is going to be a product over some of the elements of GL over K of X minus uh, G applied at Y. And this is going to be raised to some power. Um, this power is coming from the inseparable inseparability degree, right? So if your extension is separable, this is just a one. Um, okay, so then you look at the shape of this polynomial, you use some of the properties of the spectral value, and then you conclude that uh, you do have this equality. This norm is equal to the spectral. Norm. Okay, and finally, um, we have to prove the unique extension theorem. So this was the claim that if uh, K is complete with respect to a multiplicative norm, I can extend uniquely. Uh, so the, the spectral norm is going to be the only norm on L that extends the norm on K. So to finish this, uh, we have to check uh, uniqueness. I don't know what the sound is. I think that might be nice. Okay. 
I guess you could leave it on charge okay. and defend that thing here. Okay. Um, does this work? I'm not. Okay. Um, Assume yes. Okay. If someone complains, I'll stop. Okay. So we have to check that the spectral norm is really uh, the only uh, norm on L that extends the normal K. Uh, and then we have to check that it is multiplicable. Uh, to check uniqueness, uh, first, um, well, it suffices to check that if I have another uh, power multiplicative K algebra norm on L that also extends the norm on K, uh, if I can check that it is equivalent uh, to the spectral norm, sorry, there's some SP missing here, I think. If I can check that it is equivalent to the spectral norm in its extension of the form K adjoint world, um, yeah, so then um, that will be enough to conclude uh, the theorem. And now that is true because uh, K is complete with respect to the norm. And ky over k is a finite finite extension, so it only admits uh, one extension of the norm. Okay, and then to check uh, that the spectral norm is multiplicative, then um, we do this one element at a time, right? So we have to check that it is multiplicative for each element y in k. And here we do the last smoothing uh, procedure that we are going to have to do for the proof. And what this tells you is that for each, if you fix some element y, you can construct uh, some norm, norms of y or something on, on L, such that y is multiplicative for this norm. But then uh, we have uniqueness, right? So we have already checked that the spectral norm has to be equal to this norm. And therefore, since y is multiplicative for this new norm, it has to be multiplicative for the spectral norm. Okay. Um, so this uh, concludes the sketch of the proof of these theorems. Um, I want to discuss a couple of implementation comments now. So first, I try to um, set things up so that I could reuse some of the things that are already in MATLAB. So this uh, like norm field or semi norm ring and so on structures that we have. Uh, however, this has uh, some limitations because I cannot use them to consider several semi norms on the same ring. Right. And this is something that you just said that I need because the, the proof works by considering uh, several seminars on the same thing. Right. Um, so what I need to do instead is I need to introduce new classes, uh, a green seminar, green norm, and so on, uh, that will capture the property that a certain function is uh, a seminar or a norm or whatever, uh, but it won't tell me that this is the canonical norm on R, which is what a norm field or seminar ring will take. Okay. Um, okay, so I will need that. Uh, the second thing that I want to do, and this is still uh, in progress, is I want to connect these non Archimedean norms that we have been considering to valuation, valuations of rank one. So, um, if we have a valuation on an R, in R uh, taking values in some group with zero comma, uh, we say that this valuation has rank one if, well, first, the valuation is non-trivial, and also uh, there, is, there exists some injective morphism uh, from this group with zero gamma to the non-negative uh, reals. Okay, um, so mathematically, it's clear that this is the same as uh, having a non-trivial non-Archimedean norm, uh, but I want to construct a dictionary so that we can go from one kind of structure to the other in math. And um, the advantages of doing this is, because, is that then we can keep using this uh, API that we have for norms, but also the API that we have for valuations. Okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so maybe I should stop now and see if there are questions uh, about this part of the talk before moving on to number theory. Or, well, maybe, maybe I'll just continue on. Okay. Um, okay. So now mm, we are going to move on to some something kind of different, some application of this uh, 
of having this formalization of CP. And for this, let me remind you the definition of color representation. I'm going to fix a periodic field K. So if you want K is equal to QP, but it will also be some finite extension of QP, for example. And I'm going to denote by GK the absolute color group of uh, this field K. Then a periodic color representation is going to be a continuous group homomorphism from this GK uh, to the group of automorphisms of some finite dimensional QP vector space E. And the example that we want to keep in mind today is the etal homology of uh, a smooth proper variety of a K. Um, so, yeah, so this is a finite dimensional QP uh, vector space. Uh, it admits an, an action of GK. So, this is a color representation. And we say that it comes from geometry because it is, a, it is associated to this uh, variety X. Right? Um, a question that you could ask is uh, how can you identify all of the color representations that come from geometry in some sense? Right? And a precise uh, version of this is the fontaine measure conjecture, right? Uh, so, okay, uh, the setting here is we are going to fix a number field F and a prime number P. And we, we will say, we are going to give a criterion, a con conjectural criterion for when a finite dimensional periodic representation comes from geometry. So, the criterion is that uh, if P is a finite dimensional periodic representation of the absolute color group of F, such that for all but finite many primes of F, um, the representation is unramified at the prime. Um, sorry, this will be my fact here. Hopefully it's not confusing. And then also for all primes uh, P in F, above the uh, fixed prime P. Uh, if you consider the, restric the restriction of the, um, the representation to the periodic part, uh, that representation is the run. And um, we'll say more about what that means later. Right? But OK, so you have a finite uh, dimensional uh, representation that satisfies um, all of these local conditions. Then the claim is that it comes from geometry in the sense that it is a sub quotient of some uh, etal homology of some variety, uh, maybe twisted by some power of the cyclotomic uh, character. Okay. Now, uh, this conjecture is still pretty open in the general case. I think only the case uh, of dimension two is known. Okay. Um, so now, now we are going to talk about Fontaine's period rings, which were a strategy of Fontaine's to study uh, color representation. So he's going to construct a series of rings uh, that can be used to identify uh, properties, uh, sorry, uh, to identify color representations having some interesting properties. Uh, so basically speaking, a uh, Fontaine period ring is going to be a QP algebra, topological QP algebra B that admits a continual, con continuous linear action of GK uh, with some, maybe with some additional structures. So for example, a Frobenius map or a filtration or some other things. Um, and these additional structures should be compatible with the color action. And then we are also going to ask that uh, if we take GK invariance of B, what we get is a field. And if we look at this, um, this tensor here, so we tensor B with the representation P over QP, and we take a, a color invariance, then this is a vector space over BGK. Uh, this also is going to inherit any additional structure that we had on B. We're still going to have it on uh, this uh, vector space. And it's going to be some kind, some interesting invariant of the color representation. And we will say that uh, the representation is V admissible 
if the dimension of this vector space that we just defined um, considered as a vector space over BGK is the same as uh, the dimension over QP of the representation V. Um, so we always have uh, the dimension over BGK is less than or equal to the dimension over QP. And if we actually have equality, then we say that the representation is uh, B admissible. Okay, uh, so what are some examples of, uh, of these things V and what do they tell us about uh, Galar, Galar representations? So, okay, so for the examples, I'm going to assume that K is equal to QP, but you could define them in greater generality if you wanted. Okay, so the first one is we can just take uh, B is equal to the algebraic, algebraic closure of QP. And then a representation is uh, K algebraic admissible if and only if the color action on the representation factors to a finite quotient. A second example that we could consider is uh, CP, the, the field of uh, periodic complex numbers that we define in the first part of the, of the talk. Then uh, the representation V is CP admissible uh, if and only if the action of the inertia group factors through a finite quotient. Okay, now um, we are going to define the next uh, period in uh, B hot state. So this is going to be CP adjoint XX inverse, where X is some variable. Um, then our representation is B hot state admissible or just a hot state. If uh, when you tensor the representation with CP, it's going to decompose as, uh, sorry, this will be isomorphism here. It decomposes as a direct sum of CP twisted by some powers of the um, cyclotomic character. So um, CP can give some knowledge for X. That's not trivial. Yeah, it's not part of the cyclotomic character. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, so yeah, so this code here is the definition of B hot state in lean. So first, uh, CPXY is just polynomials into variables over CP. Um, so yeah, that's MP polynomial is multivariate polynomial, fin2 means that I'm taking two variables. Uh, and then a B hot state is going to be uh, the quotient of this um, polynomial ring into variables by the relation that x times y has to be equal to one. So I have to quotient by the ideal x, y minus one. Okay. And then the last uh, ring that we'll discuss today is uh, be the run. Um, so we we'll say that the, the representation is the run. Um, if and only if it's uh, admissible with respect to this ring be the ram. Uh, the definition of be the ram is quite involved. So that's what I'm going to show you in the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, but we have in MATLAB all of the ingredients that we needed to be able to actually uh, define it. Well, other than uh, CP that I just defined. So, um, okay, so the first step is um, we are going to consider the inverse limit uh, of this OCP mod the ideal P, uh, where the inverse limit maps are given by sending X to X to the P. So this is sometimes called the perfection of the ring. And this is in Matlab uh, by Kenny Lau, I think. And yeah, so we just define P to be the ring perfection of uh, this host. Okay. Next, uh, we define a ring A inf to be the bit vectors of this ring E. Uh, again, bit vectors are already implemented, so we just have to write bit vector of this ring. And next, we define B inf plus uh, to be um, A inf adjoining one over P. So to do this uh, in lean, we just localize away from P. Now, uh, we can see that there is some uh, canonical surjective uh, homomorphism from this ring being plus uh, to CP. And we 
are going to define V the RAM plus as the completion of V in plus uh, with respect to the, um, the kernel of this map. So that's what we are doing in this line is uh, taking the added completion with respect to the ideal kernel of theta and the ring V in plus. And finally, uh, B the RAM is defined to be the field of fractions of B the RAM plus. Okay, so um, we were able to write this definition. Okay, um, so just quickly, I'll say a couple of things that I, I'm still working on and I'm, I'm going to work next. First, I have to finish the proof of the extension theorem. So there are still some stories that I have to fill in in those proofs. Um, the next thing that I want to do is this dictionary between norms and valuation. And then once I have that, I, I will actually change the definition of GP. So before I was taking the completion using Cauchy sequences, but once I have this dictionary, what I do is I'll take the valued field structure on QP corresponding to the norm field structure that we already have. And then I will define CP to be the uniform space completion of, uh, of this um, with, with respect to this valuation. And the advantages of doing this is that uh, thanks to the machinery that we have in MATLAB, I will automatically get that CP is a field and I will automatically get the extension of the valuation to CP. Um, okay, then uh, the next things are like proving some results about these screens. So um, I want to prove that CP is algebraically closed so that we have that really is the thing that we were looking for is really an error of, of the complex numbers. And also that QPR is not complete so that we were really doing something in this last step and we are not just taking QPR is equal to CP, which will not be true. And then maybe uh, prove some properties of these um, uh, Fontaine period rings. Um, yeah, so this is all that I wanted to discuss today. And um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. So, oh, um, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, there's a great hand. Yeah, can you hear people? Feel free to ask. Yeah. You be able to hear you. Okay. So uh can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, hi. but hi Maria. It's still recording. Uh,